Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second talk of the term. Um, today we have with us uh, Mr. Mike Clare, who is going to give a talk on ocean geology. Mike, uh, Mike is, uh, works, works in Fugro as a um, research geologist, geological engineer, something like that, uh, as well as uh, uh, he, he's also doing a PhD in the University of Southampton um, in uh, ocean geology. So without further ado, um, I give the stage to Mike. Well, thanks very much to, to Leo for inviting me. Yeah, as, as Leo said, I kind of this talk will be almost split into two halves. Um, I'm a, a geologist by background. Um, I graduated about 11 years ago from Southampton University, mostly focusing on um, uh, marine geology. Um, and since that time, I've been working in industry, mostly in uh, offshore oil and gas. Um, but not in exploration, in trying to understand the ground conditions where we put foundations, uh, and also trying to understand potential hazards that could impact on subsea pipelines, cables, and oil and gas infrastructure. Um, but I'm also doing research alongside that, looking into to geohazards, so looking at submarine landslides, looking at the frequency of, of earthquakes. Today was something on um, looking at the seafloor, looking under the seafloor, um, and what do we know, what don't we know, and, and, and what are the hazards. Um, so the talk I'm doing today, I work for Figaro part time. I do research part time at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. Um, I should probably say I'm not here in any official capacity on, on, on for either of these people. Uh, the data, particularly that I show from Figaro, will be data that's also accessible in the public domain. So. Any idea where this is? Mars. Yeah, so I think there's some spectacular images of, of Mars that are coming out. This isn't the ocean. Um, now maybe there's evidence for water here, but I think the stuff that really fascinates me is, is Mars has been studying the surface of Mars since the 1600s. Um, certainly since the, the mid 80s, we've been getting some really fantastic images of Mars, and we're now looking at kind of meter, and in some cases, sub-meter resolution of the surface of Mars. The sorts of images we're getting in these kind of impact craters, we're not just seeing the crater, we're seeing what's going on inside them. We're seeing spectacular imagery, which we can put into these 3D digital elevation models. And the surprise to me is this is really comparable to some of the morphology that we see on Earth. Um, so this is from, uh, from California, where we see uh, alluvial fans and debris flows that wash out from that. The spectacular imagery, and in fact, all of the surface of Mars is mapped which has allowed the USGS, the US Geological Survey, to create these incredible and detailed maps of the geology of Mars. So we come back to Earth now. The oceans cover more than two-thirds of the surface of Earth. But to date, we've, we've explored less than 5% of the ocean, yet we've got maps of the whole of the surface of Mars. There seems to be something missing here. There's still a lot left to learn about most of the surface of our planet. The most, most of the sea floor lies <coughs> in what we call abyssal depths of about 4,000 to 5,000 meters water depth. And below about 200 meters, certainly below about 20 meters in many cases, there's, there's no light of any significant amount. So we're working in very, very dark, deep environments with extremely high pressures. There's some really peculiar organisms and animals that live down there, many of which cope with that life. And it's kind of a privilege to be able to see these whilst actually doing geology and to be able to interface with marine biologists and oceanographers. But looking at the very deepest parts of our oceans, we're finding out fundamentally new things about the Earth. We're finding out things like um, these black smokers, hydrothermal vents. That there are communities of animals there that don't exist in the same way as many of the other communities do on Earth. We've also seen places where the Earth is actually being split apart and new crust is being formed. But this is all relatively new science. <clears throat> Why don't we know more? Well, it's difficult. If you compare this to space travel, the logistics are quite different. But light and logistics, in space you can pretty much see forever. Under the sea, 
um, it's very, very dark. There's logistical issues, I mean, getting to space is difficult, but getting to the bottom of the sea is difficult. But one of those reasons is that those sort of abyssal water depths is equivalent to one person trying to support 50 jumbo jets. And there's currents and all sorts of other challenges. In the case of hydrothermal vents, there's very hot temperatures, corrosive uh, waters. So I think the reason I was asked to do the talk today is, is Fugro is, is, is currently involved in looking for uh, the Malaysian flight MH370. Um, so you show on the right here, this is water depth in metres, and then the Burj Khalifa here has just shown multiple times over the scale. You see about 200 metres, that's where about 90% of all marine life lives. You've got up there 318 metres, which is the world record depth for scuba divers. We have to dive all the way down there to about 5,000 metres, which is the possible depth that's been indicated for the black box devices from MH370. And below that depth here are the depths which we've actually been able to send autonomous underwater vehicles, so robots that have a, a survey <coughs> programmed into them, uh, and they allow us to start to map the seafloor. Um, so we go down in our, our mapping capabilities to about 6,000 metres water depth being able to map to a, a high, high resolution. So in this talk, I'm going to give an overview of how and, and why we explore the deep sea. There are many more reasons as to that which I'll present today, but in part it will revolve around uh, human activities, so oil and gas exploration, uh, and also the need for communication networks, um, but also for understanding societally important hazards, so perhaps tsunamis that can be created by submarine landslides. I'll outline some of the challenges and give a flavour of some of the findings that have been made in recent years uh, and are also ongoing. Uh, and just pose a few questions on what's still out there. Any ideas when this map was drawn? This is the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Get a date from anyone? Early 20th century. Early 20th century. 1880. This is joined in 1961, um, which is surprisingly recent given the fact that people were creating maps of the surface of Mars at the same time. This is by an incredible oceanographer. Um, she was called Mary Tharp, uh, who did a lot of work with Bruce Heason. And over about 40 years, they, they mapped the entire ocean. It struck me there were a lot of similarities <laughs> between that map and Middle Earth. And I wondered if we knew our own oceans as well as we knew. Uh, the outer reaches of Mordor. <laughs> Jacques Cousteau here, I, I love the guy on the left as well, I think he's brilliant. But Jacques Cousteau here is in a submersible vehicle called the Calypso. Uh, he's here in 1959 on his way back from crossing uh, the Atlantic Ocean where he creates some incredible videos of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So this is the place where new crust is being born uh, and the Earth is, is basically, uh, the, the ocean is, is spreading. Um, and this is, this is part of the fundamental um, theory called plate tectonics. Um, but many, many scientists, many geologists uh, didn't accept this. And it's only really because of videos and uh, images of the ocean seafloor that, that any scientists really kind of gave this any credibility. So from echo soundings, from basically pinging a sound at the seafloor and waiting to see how long it comes back, you understand how fast sound travels in seawater, you can create these interesting cross-sections, which is a vessel transect, which is basically pinging sound up and down. And these are transects across the Atlantic Ocean, and they really do show uh, these, these phenomenal ridges in the centre and, and large pinnacles, these kind of uh, submarine volcanoes in many places. And these are mountain ranges, uh, which are, are bigger typically than those that we see uh, on the surface. Uh, of the continents. So here we see Bruce Heason, um, who was creating these maps with Mary Darth in about 1940, looking at a thalagram. So he's looking at the results of these pings of the sounds which are bouncing off the seafloor and creating these incredible cross sections, which Mary Darth and he, uh, this is in 1977, so he's looking a bit older with Mary Darth. Um, created this, this phenomenal map. And if you look at modern day maps of the ocean, not a whole lot has changed. The resolution's a bit better, maybe the places of where these things are. But they were creating, from, from first scientific principles, uh, an observational map, and then using this 
uh, as the basis for establishing an understanding of, of how continents spread and how they move. These are beautiful maps, but the resolution of these is not sufficient um, for us to look for average 370, for example, and, and there are many, many surprises when we go to the seafloor still in the present day that there's maybe a, a submarine mountain that wasn't where we were expecting it to be. So we need to use tools to do this. Um, I work for Food Grove. Someone's described the Food Grove fleet as a bit like Thunderbirds. Uh, it's probably not quite as exciting, but we do have things that fly, we have things that go under the water, and we have things that go into the ground. And the way Bruce Heason was looking at mapping the ocean was, was looking at echo sounding. So he was looking at sound bouncing back, uh, and traditionally, uh, a single beam echo sounder listens for the same beam. It's quite time consuming, and you're only mapping this very small part of the seafloor. So that point where we're getting the sounding back you see you're missing out on huge amounts of information. So modern technology allows us to look at what we call a swap of sound. So we can take multiple pings. This is uh, a multi-beam echo sounder. And this allows us to get a much greater coverage. Now the resolution at which we can map the seafloor really depends on the water depth. Um, so if there's a huge water depth, the swap is very wide. And once we map a very big area, we get quite coarse resolution. We, the bin sizes that our data come in become progressively bigger as we go deeper. Now one way to mitigate that is to have devices that can autonomously mirror the seafloor and can go down deeper, they get closer to it. It's more time consuming, so depending on why you need to map the ocean and what you're looking for will depend on whether you get this coarse resolution or whether you can zoom in. So the sorts of devices that we use for mapping the ocean seafloor, um, and these are all tools um, that Fugro use, um, include these multi-beam echo sounders. So you've got um, up here what we call a, a hull-mounted multi-beam echo sounder. This is mounted on the hull of the boat. The deeper the water depth, the lower the resolution data. We have uh, these autonomous underwater vehicles, so we can get closer to the seafloor and we can get a more resolute version of the seafloor map. We can tow things called sub-bottom profilers. So this operates at a slightly different frequency. Um, so this, at a, a lower frequency, will allow us to not just look at what's coming back from the sea floor, but will allow us also to get the reflections from beds and other geological units that are under the sea floor as well. So we can now start to map underneath it. And this technique known as seismic reflection is, is the way that we map uh, oil and gas reservoirs. We also tow other devices like side scan sonars. This tells us how reflective the seafloor is. I'll show some images of that later. And magnetometers. So we can use this for, for wind farms, for example, for looking for unexploded <coughs> ordnance, uh, World War II bombs uh, in, say, the English Channel, which you don't want to hit if you're installing a wind farm foundation. And the resolution of data we get really varies. For typical oil and gas exploration, you're interested in something deep, several kilometers below the sea floor. Um, so you use fairly, uh, fairly low resolution, fairly low frequency tools. And that allows you to characterize sediments that are many thousands of meters below the sea floor that may host hydrocarbons. But the first reflection from that data set, the first thing that the, the sound bounces off is the sea floor. So we might get an image like this. Um, this is from the Mediterranean, and we can map out this, this almost circular feature here. Um, and because we can see what's going on on the subsurface with this data, we know that there's, there's mobile mud that is uh, much less dense than the sediment above it. It's pushing its way up, and this is what we call a mud volcano. So under the sea, but also onshore in places, uh, places like, like Russia, uh, on the, near the Caspian Sea as well, you get these mud volcanoes, which is liquid mud, which is coming from many kilometers depth pushing up and erupting like a volcano instead of lava, it's mud. If we go back with an autonomous underwater vehicle, so we fly closer to the seafloor, we get a better resolution image. We can start to see really fantastic levels of, of, of detail. In this case, down to, to less than half a meter uh, in terms of horizontal resolution. We can map out tension cracks. We can map out uh, features here, which are the, the run out from debris flows see other submarine landslides that have been created by 
uh, mud eruptions under the sea. So the, the area in the, the vicinity of, of where it's, it's thought that MH370 may have crashed um, is, is poorly understood. There's a few papers that have come out recently, this is one in May last year, that say we probably know less than 5% of this area, but we do our own oceans. This digital elevation model here um, shows the spiky seafloor. Now there's a lot of vertical exaggeration on this. Often to make the seafloor look sexy, there's, there's a lot of exaggeration on the seafloor. But there are very prominent peaks that are several kilometers high. Um, and these have come as a bit of a surprise to some of the, the hunt uh, for Fair Lodge 370. So if you kind of step back and look at the area that this place, that the plane could be, this is a, this is a huge area. Uh, I'm particularly looking at, at this area here, this swath of seafloor is, is very large. So to survey this is very time consuming. <coughs> so this is um, how the search area stood. Um, it was broken down into different uh, priorities for searching. And the idea will be, ideally, that the whole area will be surveyed. This is 60,000 square kilometers. This takes a lot of time for ships that are basically going backwards and forwards uh, on given tracks. There's about 200 staff working on the hunt, um, specifically on the survey data. Um, and the aim of this is to create a data set where it's going to be possible to identify objects that are about two meters by two meters resolution. So that should be um, sufficient for, for bits of fuselage. But there's some degree of luck in, in looking for any object on the seafloor, let alone an airplane. This gives some idea of scale. This is the sort of water depth that we're looking at. This is <coughs> one of the figure of vessels which is actually hunting uh, for stuff on the seafloor. Again, the brush Khalifa seems to make it do everything that's got height. Hopefully, someone builds a nice taller building soon. But the tools that are being used are whole mounted echo sounders and also these autonomous underwater vehicles, which are, are pinging um, the sound in a swap uh, several times a uh, second to try and understand what's going on on the seafloor. Two vessels that are out there are, are kind of industry standard uh, survey vessels. And these are the sorts of images that are coming back in now. This is the kind of uh, the width of that search area. Um, and we're finding some fantastic stuff about the seafloor. And whilst it's an absolute tragedy, um, it is highlighting how poor we know our oceans. Um, there are now uh, increasingly concerted efforts to try and map the seafloor so we get a better idea of what's going on. Again, you find these anomalies which were really smoothed out in the, uh, the low resolution maps that were provided before. Um, and this, this ridge is, is pretty much a newly mapped feature. So for a lot of the search, the weather's calm, but as with any operation offshore, logistics are an issue. Uh, and weather can be a tremendous problem uh, with any offshore survey or site investigation. I'll just show a few pictures of inside the vessels, but these are modern survey vessels where you can see a lot of different things are going on at one time. Um, and if you have the pleasure of going offshore, you have offshore cinemas, nationalized chairs, gyms, uh, places to chill out in between the shifts. So it's not the worst place in the world to be. A recent example, this was probably in about 2008, 2009, a, a pipeline survey was being performed. So uh, Figaro was commissioned by Gaussi. Uh, to go and look at the seafloor um, to try and identify the best place to lay uh, a large diameter pipeline which is going to export gas. So this is a technique called side scan sonar. So this is looking at how reflective the seafloor is. And if something's hard, same way as when you shout inside a tunnel, you get more echo. Uh, so in this case, the, the black is strong reflectivity, the whites are low reflectivity, and the vessel track, the vessel was moving this way, and this is now looking at a swap either side of the vessel. So this sort of uh, imagery allows us to see debris, boulders that we want to avoid for a pipeline, but also allows us to, to see this sort of feature, which was initially interpreted as, as a wreck, and turns out correct, correctly so. We can take robotic underwater vehicles, or remotely operated vehicles, uh, which are tethered by an umbilical or a cable that talks to the vessel. And these can swim down and perform 
Uh, they can take photos, take videos, we can attach arms to them, and they can do all sorts of other construction activities. And with those different suites of tools, the top here we see uh, multi-beam echo sounders, so seafloor data, looking at about 25 centimeter horizontal resolution. Here we see the top of a warship. We can take um, the same data and look at different angles of the boat and create these, these 3D renderings. In this case, we were able to see the turrets of this, this wreck. We used our, our remotely operated vehicle to go down and take video and to identify specifics about the vessel. Uh, and in this case, it was identified as the Danton, which is um, a French warship, um, which is classified as, as, as a war grave. Um, but the, the, the data that Finger were able to get here um, provided a lot more information about the wreck um, and also uh, how it was sunk and the damage that was done. So it's possible to resolve quite small features, even the, the turrets of these guns. What Fugro does isn't just wreck hunting. We survey pipelines to try and find the best route for them, to try and make sure there's no rupture um, and that they, they, they take the most optimal route. But also we explore the seafloor on the subsea floor because when an asset has been identified by an oil and gas operator, we need to understand how the foundations can go in the ground and whether it will, it will handle them. And the water depths at which oil and gas infrastructure is put in really varies from tens of metres all the way to many thousands of metres water depth. The infrastructure on the seafloor is complex. It's not just a case of drill a borehole, produce gas. You need to link things to manifolds, pipelines, and then you need to somehow either get that to shore or to ship the product. <coughs> and the structures that we're looking at are big. These are, these are huge uh, platforms that might have several hundred people on them. And I think if we see this, this is a concrete-based platform. You can see the, the number of tugs that are needed to tow this out. So it's important to understand the seafloor because we need to know how it's going to behave when we put a foundation on it. Equally, offshore <coughs> renewables um, uh, are really being pushed now. Um, and we need to make sure turbines are going to stay up. They're being affected by dynamic loads, by currents on the seafloor, by waves which actually load on the structure itself, and also the dynamic load of the turbine being turned. And cables. Cables need to be installed. And in many cases, cables, this could be uh, high voltage distribution cables, it could be communication cables, need to be installed in the seafloor somehow. In many cases, they're laid on the surface, um, but for high voltage cables, uh, they, they may actually need to be within the substrate. Um, so this pretty fantastic looking toy here uh, is actually digging a trench that a cable or a pipeline can be laid into. And then we need to get samples and to perform tests of the subsurface as well. So this is a, a drilling vessel. Uh, you can tell that because it's got this large derrick here. Um, so we're actually able to, to drill several hundred meters below the seafloor if necessary. And we have other tools to do this. So this is uh, another derrick where we can drill. We have um, uh, drills which can actually be lowered onto the sea floor, which avoids the need to have several hundreds or thousands of meters of drill string actually hanging through the water column. This is deployed to the sea floor and drills away and continues uh, down from the sea floor. Uh, and various other uh, sea floor tools most of the data that I look, as, uh, look at as a geologist and sedimentologist are, are what we call sediment cores. So we take continuous long samples, in some cases tens or hundreds of meters of samples, below the sea floor. And this allows us to look at the deposits in the same way as you look at a rock outcrop. Um, so we can perform kind of like a forensic analysis of what's happened at that site. So if we see evidence of submarine landslides, we can look at millimetric level of detail of what's happened at that site. When have landslides happened? So we can look at radiocarbon dating and other dating techniques to try and understand when they occur, what their frequency is, how that frequency relates perhaps to past sea levels, past climates, and what that might mean for the future. Do we anticipate the same number of landslides in the future? And what does that mean for perhaps breakage of cables? So some of the tools we use are piston cores. It's not just a case of of uh, throwing a cylinder into the seafloor, it's 
that there's a bit more of an art behind it. So we, uh, we launched the, the piston corer down from the Stinger, this is this deployment frame. Um, and typically we use these in, in several hundreds to thousands of meters water depth. Uh, the barrel length can be up to or over about 30 meters. Um, and the intention is to, to lower this uh, carefully to the sea floor, so 3,000 meters water depth. This will take several hours. And you note there's a, there's a, base, a base plate on the bottom of the tool here as well. This stops it deforming the most shallow sediments at sea floor. And because we're interested in the processes that have happened recently, those recent sediments tell us the most recent events that have occurred. So we send down kind of a, a plumb line or a trigger line ahead uh, of the head of the core, and that actually is going to tell us when we're just about to reach sea floor. And that allows us to take a measurement uh, of the, the coordinates uh, of the core itself and also allows us to know when we should trigger the core so we don't trigger it too early or trigger it too late. Then the core is lowered down to sea floor, you'll see there's a triggering mechanism at the top. Um, and when it's fired in, the piston releases uh, and it progressively uh, pushes the sample into the ground rather than just relying on gravity for it to make its way in. So the, uh, the trigger weight leads first. We know we're pretty much at sea floor. So then we can more carefully lower the sampler to the sea floor. And then we prepare the piston. And fairly soon, the whole thing will be fired and we'll start to see it not too excitingly go in because it goes in at a fairly steady rate so we don't deform the sediments. And then we go, and it's going to push into the sea floor. Then the whole thing is retracted, brought up to deck, um, and we chop it up into to meter long sections. Uh, and split it and examine it exactly the same way as a geologist would look at a rock outcrop. So beyond just looking at the sea, uh, I guess Fugra has a whole, whole range of different tools it uses for mapping, from looking at aerial geophysics, so trying to understand uh, what's going on on the surface of the planet, but also imaging below the, uh, the surface. Uh, Fugra does weather forecasting, it does weather predictions. Um, it's installed wave rider boys for tsunami detection. Um, and we do a whole lot of work onshore as well, which supports some of the very biggest buildings. Yes? Uh, what is the aerial geophysics the thing measuring? Um, so it does a whole, a whole load of different things. So some of the stuff is LIDAR. So some of it is actually looking at elevation. It's topographic mapping. In some cases, it's uh, electrical or magnetic mapping. So in which case, it's looking for magnetic or electrical anomalies. Um, and they typically are associated with deeper geology. Okay, I understand the magnetic anomalies, electric anomalies in the sense of? So in terms of uh, variations of resistivity, so if you have a hydrocarbon res reservoir, for example, it has a very different response to something which is uh, a water reservoir or something which has no pore space associated. But you're actually putting a voltage across it yourself? Or I, I don't exactly know how the resistivity works. I don't think there's any, um, anything being put across it. Um, so these are all remotely sensed tools. Um, so the aerial geophysics is either used for surveying, for placement of structures, or for looking at, at deeper information. Um, one of the beauties of being offshore is that we don't have anything getting in the way of us on the seafloor. We can just go above it on the seafloor. Um, with the aerial side of things, people tend to get in the way, and people's structures tend to get in the way. Um, Where my research kind of overlaps with the, with the Fugro work is, is I'm interested in, in geohazards. Um, I'm interested in not just things that affect oil and gas developments or, or pipelines, but also interested in things that have the potential to, to cause problems for us. So whether it's landslides that could trigger tsunami, that could endanger coastal communities, uh, or indeed any other hazard. I'm interested in the frequency of hazards, the timescales on which they happen. So for, for oil and gas developments, for example, this could be in, in consequential events like sediment uh, mobilization by bottom currents, um, which could be slightly problematic for foundations if you get some scour around them, but you can mitigate against that by putting scour protection down. Major hazards would <coughs> could be um, shallow gas blowouts. Um, in the case of this jack-up platform, so a jack-up platform is basically a platform which is floated out, it has maybe three legs, 
and the whole platform is jacked up on those legs. Uh, if something happens, one of those legs uh, could, could collapse, the, the ring could fall over. If you have people on it, that's a big deal. But I'm also interested in big <coughs> hazards. So I, I give some, uh, some kind of natural and man-made examples here. Um, it's the big hazards that are the ones that make us reappraise the way that, that, that we look at risk. Um, certainly the Deepwater Horizon uh, incident in the Gulf of Mexico has made the whole oil and gas industry reappraise the way it looks at what you might call black swan events, the, uh, the kind of low probability but high impact events that previously might not be considered to be a, that much of an issue, but they do happen. When they happen, they're a huge deal. They can uh, do huge reputational damage, but beyond that, the damage to the environment, societal consequences can be huge. Part of my research is looking at, is there a gradual continuum of scale and frequency, uh, or is there a step change or, or some, some threshold at which these, natural, these, these large, high-impact, uh, extreme events occur? Um, so I'll, I'll touch on some of that with landslides. I won't show too much. The sorts of data that we get offshore from an oil and gas development, I've said we get the first return, the first sounding back, that's the seafloor. That's the top bit here. Um, this is an example from the Gulf of Mexico. This is in about two and a half, three thousand meters water depth. Um, the scale across it is probably about 30 or 40 kilometers across and maybe about 20 kilometers down. We have part of the continental slope, which is shown here. It's quite a complicated seafloor. We've got evidence of scars from past submarine landslides. We have faults. We have the evidence of salt that's pushing its way up in exactly the same way as the mud volcano I showed you operated. But we can see images of what's going on beneath the seafloor. This allows us to understand what happened in the past, or we can try and relate this to what might happen in the future if the conditions are similar. The scale of some of these landslides is, is, is pretty, pretty large. You can see the scale of it's five kilometers. And this whole area on the right hand side here is a submarine landslide. So this MTD stands for mass transport deposit. These blocks, some of them the size of houses, they all initiated from the shelf break here. This is a, a coral shelf break off Malaysia. Um, this turns out to be a very old landslide. This is, this is over 45,000 years old. But <coughs> should something like this happen <coughs> in the future, this could impact any sort of infrastructure on the seafloor, uh, but also has the potential to trigger tsunami, perhaps locally in this case. But in the case of the Sterega landslide, which is located off the Norwegian coast, this is a pretty famous submarine landslide. This mobilized more than 3,000 cubic kilometers of sediment in one, or pretty much one event. Uh, it occupies an area larger than the size of Scotland. Um, and this created a tsunami um, which has been, uh, or at least evidence of which has been identified in Scotland, uh, Norway, and, and various other places. This was a big event that only happened a few a thousand years ago. Um, and should another one of these happen, there's very few natural hazards, uh, if any, that pose such a great threat to the coastal communities of the UK. So there's, there's active research into these landslides to try and identify what the triggers are and what the potential of the recurrence of these is. Do these relate solely to the melt-out from ice sheets a few thousand years ago, or is there, is there potential for these to happen in the future? And because they're extreme events, we've never observed one of these. I say we've never been fortunate enough, or maybe unfortunate enough to have seen one of these. One of the remarkable things, I simply we put vertical exaggeration on our seafloor to make it more sexy, the average slope angle where most of these submarine landslides occur on many margins worldwide is less than one degree. Um, I put Oxford United up here because that's about the same angle as the drainage on a football pitch. Um, yet we can fail huge volumes of sediment. And trying to understand how this happens is, is, is difficult because in conventional geotechnical terms onshore, uh, slopes of usually about 15 degrees are stable. And this is unstable at less than one degree. So this generates a tsunami, and there's, there's recent evidence to suggest um, that one of the more recent tsunamis in Japan uh, featured a second wave, which was uh, also created by a, a subsequent submarine landslide triggered by the initial earthquake. <coughs> so 
So we can look at some analogues to this, and many of the, the, the morphology of these failures, uh, in many cases, looks quite similar to, to slow avalanches. What happens with a slow avalanche is typically a failure surface develops, and then rapidly that fracture propagates. And it may propagate up, and it may propagate down. It spreads. It can be on relatively low angles, but it can mobilize huge amounts of snow. <coughs> and as that snow starts to move down the slope, it can entrain water. It starts as water. It can entrain air and starts to take that air in. Um, and it can generate this kind of avalanche cloud. And very similar things happen underneath the sea. Um, or when a large submarine landslide takes in water instead of air, it generates what we call turbidity currents. And that landslide then starts to behave as a flow. Uh, and that flow moves by its excess density. And these flows can be many thousands of cubic kilometers of sediment. And as a result, they transport sand to the deep sea, so they represent good uh, potential reservoirs if they're buried by several kilometers of rock. But they can also run out for many hundreds of kilometers. Some of the other analogs come from uh, looking at pyroclastic flows. So here we see the development of a pyroclastic flow. So you can see as the, uh, the land style of the failure starts to entrain water, and there's also hot air, um, you get the generation of this pyroclastic flow, which is moving by, by its kind of excess density, um, creating this, this incredible billowing cloud. Um, this is the sort of thing you can't outrun. Um, I show this because I, I think this is fascinating. This guy gives it a really good go, and the luck seems to be in his favour. Uh, under the sea, locally, we see these, these flows are called turbidity currents when they're generated from a submarine landslide. We often see sometimes that the influence of currents can deflect them. And in this case, you see the influence of the wind as the uh, pyroclastic flow just comes around the bend. But this flow is never going to make it to him, and it's suddenly deflected off to the side. But we haven't witnessed these flows in the ocean, so we need to go to the laboratory to try and understand them. <coughs> so this is a turbidity current which is generated on a low angle slope on a, a long flume in Utrecht, uh, and then Eurotank flume, which is uh, several tens of meters long. Um, and you can see this billowing cloud of sediment, which is moving by its excess density. But these flows can be enormous. I come back to the incredible maps of, of Heaton and Carl. They pointed out but there are areas which appear to be submarine rivers. Uh, and certainly in the areas of uh, the outflow of some of the major rivers on Earth, you get these offshore from the Congo River and also the Amazon, the Nile. Um, you have these, these huge parent delta systems and submarine fans, which are made of, of, of huge thicknesses of sediment. These are the, the largest accumulations of sediment on the face of our planet. Uh, and they're caused by uh, deposition from turbidity currents. So the Indus fan just here is at the outlet of one of the world's major rivers, likewise the Bengal fan. Uh, here we have a seafloor image at the very top, which comes across the Indus fan about here. And you can see these, these incredible, sinuous, um, meandering submarine channels. There's evidence for uh, what appear to be fairly fresh looking ones and less fresh looking ones. And this is where channels have been abandoned. Um, and these are the passage of these turbidity currents underneath the seafloor. There's evidence from, uh, from offshore Morocco um, and uh, from the Canary Islands that some of these flows may have been tens of kilometers wide and they've traveled uh, thousands of kilometers in distance. And they've transported sediment that is uh, several thousand cubic kilometers. So these are probably the most important process for transporting sediment on the face of our planet. Yet they're very poorly understood. We haven't seen these. We very rarely observe these. We can get an idea of some of the speed of these flows because they've broken sequential submarine cables. We know the timing at which the cables have been broken. 95% of our communications are still by subsea cables. Um, so these are strategically important networks for communication. We have evidence uh, on the right-hand side of Rocky Galpin Canyon in Taiwan in 2006, um, where 13 sequential cables were broken. But we have some evidence that these flows reach in excess of 20 meters per second. So these are fast, they're big, 
and they have the potential to break structures on the seafloor. This is a, a slide in uh, from a colleague of mine, Peter. <coughs> His background is in river systems. There are millions of measurements of density and velocity in rivers because they're relatively easy to get to. Incredibly, the sediment concentration of the turbidity current has been mapped uh, a total of zero times in deep water, which is incredible. So now it's kind of almost a golden age of looking at the turbidity currents and looking at these processes under the seafloor. The reason for this is because you have to be lucky enough to get one, and you need the tools to be able to do it. We're only just developing those tools now. The places where we're developing those tools are places like British Columbia uh, and California, and these are all genuinely terrible places to go and do field work if you have to. Um, so here on the bottom right, uh, I show uh, this is the town of Squamish in British Columbia. This is on the uh, Sea to Sky. Um, Freeway, then if you go skiing up at Whistler, you can get to it that way. Uh, here you can see the Delta Lip, and this is a river which during spring and summer is fed by meltwater from glaciers. <coughs> so it builds up at the lip and periodically it fails. So here we see that the lip, this is the sea floor, goes down to about 150, 200 metres of water depth. And these flows from failures go through these three different channels, the northern, central and southern. And we can look at repeat surveys, so 93 surveys have been uh, performed on successive days to give us an idea of how the seafloor has changed. And these are those 93 surveys stacked up. So again here, this is the delta lip, this is where sediment's building up. And periodically you'll see that a chunk or a little bite is taken out. And that's a, that's a landslide. Uh, and in these fjords in British Columbia, uh, certainly in, in the last 30 years there have been tsunami been generated by uh, failures slightly bigger than these. The other thing you'll notice is, is these crescentic features which are making their way back up the channel. And these are related to turbidity currents. So turbidity currents are creating a, a supercritical flow uh, which are causing erosion at the front of bed forms, which is making them move back up the slope. And this is the sort of thing we, we haven't seen before. It's only really since 2011, 2012, we've known this existed. We can use the same tools we used to look at the seafloor, but actually look above the seafloor now. And we can start to get images uh, a bit like a, kind of seeing your baby for the very first time. <laughs> at the top, you have a plan view looking down on the seafloor. You can see a small current coming down, and then a bigger one now dives in and cannibalizes that flow. Now these are only on a relatively small scale. They may be only a few meters thick, they may be only one or two meters per second. But we can develop the tools and technology now to start looking at the flows on a really big scale, the big systems, to try and understand uh, what do they mean for hazards, and also how do they transport sediment to deep water. That has important implications for understanding the fate of carbon in the oceans as well. <coughs> And there's some fantastic new data which has come from acoustic Doppler current profilers um, which use the, the Doppler shift to get a three-dimensional view looking downwards through the velocity within a turbidity current and can use backscatter, so the amount of sound that comes back to help us understand what concentration these flows are. This bottom example here is from the Congo Canyon from 2,000 metres water depth. And you can see the flows get up to 80 metres thickness. So I show the pyroclastic flow, it's possibly on a slightly smaller scale than that, but we know flows have got bigger than that in the past. But incredibly, these flows last six to ten days and they sustain speeds of in excess of a metre per second. If you have a cable that's running across that canyon, good luck. So going forwards, we've got some quite exciting work that's going to be done um, in collaboration with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in California, uh, the United States Geological Survey and the Ocean University of China, as well as the National Oceanography Center in Southampton, where we're looking at the Monterey Canyon, which we know is an active canyon. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is located just here, so the director can throw a stone out of his window and it lands in the head of the canyon in the ocean, it's quite a nice setup there. We know this canyon has several flows that, that operate in a year, or at least have done in the past years. So the plan is to put multiple instruments at multiple points down the canyon to try and identify um, how flows occur. Do all flows make it to the bottom of the system, and why don't some flows do that? 
previous work has, has included these instrumented concrete uh, monuments, which have a holy beacon on them. And this is demonstrated, so the, the top left panel uh, is February the 8th, 2007, where these three monuments were put in. And over the course of, of several weeks uh, and months, these were moved by turbidity currents. The, the thought was that perhaps these would perhaps move only over a few years, but actually they started moving uh, within a few days. Uh, and they don't move in the way we expected them to. Instead of all moving together in sequence, sometimes they piggyback each other. So we don't really understand what the flows are doing within the canyon and why they preferentially pick one up and move another one. In some cases, one was buried and then it reappears several months later. And the guys at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute are, are also brave enough, I think brave is the right word, to take expensive equipment and try and fly it into one of these flows. Um, no one's done this before. This is a remotely operated vehicle that, that they operate, the Dock Ricketts. A uh, recent paper published by Charlie Paul and Esther Sander from, from Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, provided these great videos. This is background conditions. They were just doing a, a standard survey to go and look at the sea floor. You can see some, some bed forms here, some ripples, but nothing's really going on. And then they notice there's a flow starting to happen. You'll start to see material moving this way down past the bed forms. Um, in some cases, there's little bits of leaf. And just after that, there's a blackout, a cloud of sediment, to visit the current. Relatively low velocity, about a meter per second. In this case, quite low sediment concentrations by volume, uh, less than 0.04%. So this is not a big flow. But it's enough to drag this, um, this three-ton remotely operated vehicle uh, down the canyon. And it really had to fight against the current and swim back out of it. So you can see um, the flow now just, just coming across it. And this is um, a flow which has a dense lower part of it, a much more dilute upper part. So I think there's, there's plenty of remaining questions. We're now starting to get some really good insights into these flows, into submarine landslides and the hazards. Um, but we don't have a brilliant hold on the triggers. We have some hypotheses for what they are, but now we can start to test them by looking at a laboratory in the ocean that's on a field scale. We can start to hopefully try and understand what their frequency is and we can understand their triggers. The big questions remain about why and how do some flows run out for hundreds or thousands of kilometers. Uh, <coughs> what happens with that flow near the seafloor? This is another question. And this is a key importance to understanding impact on pipelines, for example. Uh, we have PhD projects which are offered uh, at Southampton at the moment, so if anybody is interested in anything particularly to do with submarine landslides and turbidity currents, uh, please check out the website or just Google uh, NOC uh, turbidity current, they'll probably get you there. Um, but we've got some great projects now for really starting to look at these flows happening for the very first time, which I think is quite exciting. And I'll wrap up now on just some pictures of, of I think, cool things I've seen on the seafloor and near the seafloor. Um, this is above an oil and gas reservoir, which is at several, um, several thousand meters below the seafloor. But luckily, the, the hydrocarbon has managed to leak its way up to the seafloor. And in the same way as you get the La Brea tar pits in California, here we get what BP call asphalt volcanoes and asphalt mounds. Um, this oil is leaking its way up. And because it's so cold, it's about 5 degrees centigrade, this, this viscous hydrocarbon is solidified. It creates these mounds, which are exploited by by benefit communities. Uh, you get these cool guys up these little octopus, also eat the bugs that live on them, but they provide a uh, hard substrate for organisms otherwise that wouldn't be there. So unlike the, the hydrothermal vents, this is what we call a cold seed community. It's cold, but you get all sorts of taxa down there, uh, which you wouldn't normally get in this sort of, um, sort of water depth. The bugs that bite away the near surface sediments that sometimes create peculiar geotechnical properties that are problematic for, for pipelines, uh, these polychaete worms. Uh, and most of that near surface mud is made of, of fecal pellets, so basically the poo of these polychaete worms. Um, and it creates some real challenges for engineering because pipelines don't tend to stay still. If they're at five degrees centigrade but they're periodically full of hot hydrocarbon, they expand and contract. They walk on the seafloor maybe several meters. Um, 
and this remolds the sediment. And if the sediment is composed of a reworked polychaete poo, as it's worked down, it's remolded, it gets to a much lower shear strength, uh, and the pipelines um, can start to embed into the sediment. It's important to understand that. These guys, these amphipods, I wouldn't be picking that up. I didn't, no way. Um, <laughs> we found incredible water depths, and I think it's amazing the things we're finding in the sea. Um, I, I googled weird things under the sea, um, and I'll finish on this image, on the video, I think. I found a video from, uh, from Fubro. It's from a, a camera which is looking at exploration drilling in the Gulf of Mexico in about 8,000 feet of water. Um, and I think what they found, the cameraman can't believe it, you'll see it by the jerky nature. Um, I think he thought he saw an alien. <laughs> um, so he's supposed to be filming the drill string, which is just to the side. He's now deciding he's going to look at this thing that looks like it's out of Starship Troopers. <laughs> and it's got legs that are about eight meters long. Um, this, this is a big fin squid. Um, this one has about eight metre long tentacles. <coughs> very, very rarely seen, occasionally brought up by fishermen. Um, but it just kind of pointed out to me that uh, there's some really weird stuff out there that we still don't know much about. Um, and I think it's probably entertained everybody who was out there on the drill rig. So I think with that, um, that's everything I wanted to talk about. Um, I hope it's been of some interest. Um, I think as a, as a geologist or anyone working at sea, you get some fantastic opportunities to see interesting wildlife and you take a break. But um, I think it's, it's a fascinating field to work in because there's so much we still don't know. Uh, I don't encourage anyone that's interested uh, yeah, to get involved because uh, there's a lot more to do. Thank you. What do you think the chances are that they'll find the Malaysian Airlines plane? Well, it's a tough one, and I, I'm not really in a position to answer it. But I'll answer it from me rather than from Fubro. Um, if the search areas are sensible, and there seems to be some discrepancy, one of the papers I showed talked about um, some of the discrepancies between basically the, the last talking point of the vessel. Um, or at least the, 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 the plane um, with, uh, with the kind of the central point of, of control. Uh, it 
could be in two completely different places. And the original search shows those two arcs where it could go, you kind of end up somewhere north of India or else you go somewhere down by Australia. So on the basis that the search area is incredible, the weather's good enough to do it, um, there's a good chance that if there's a large enough piece of fuselage, bigger than two meters by two meters, say, that it should be found. Um, so our confidence in, in the survey itself, um, in terms of whether there's sufficient time to do it, and also in terms of whether it's the right search area, <coughs> you kind of have to rely on the people who've said that's the right place to look for it to be the case. Uh, if it's there and it's still a big enough size to see, then yes, it should be found. Um, but that being said, it's a huge, huge area. It's a huge undertaking. Um, and even then, what you do in the salvage operation will be, a, will be another question as well. The, the technology and the tools are there. They've all been deployed appropriately. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge bit of ocean. It's, it's just remarkable how little we know about it. How long are they running the survey for? Um, I forget what the full duration of the survey was. I think the survey contract was committed to something like just over 12 months to run for. Um, I think there was a lot of weather at the beginning. Um, it's part of the course of like, the world. There will be better seasons in the year to do the survey. And, um, and my understanding is that there's a, there's a certain you know, duration, there's a finite duration to, to the survey. If it goes beyond that, then you need to think about something else. I think it's about 12 months. Um, so it's as much as that area as can be covered, which is why it's broken down into kind of high, medium, and low priority areas. Um, the hope being it's in one of the high priority areas. Mm. Any more questions? All right. Thanks for coming, everyone, and thank you for coming too. Um, <laughs> um, we have um, refreshments outside, so do help yourselves to them uh, once uh, I'm done. Um, there will be no talk next week. Our speaker had to pull out um, before term started because of family emergency. So. Uh, <laughs> so um, size up events will uh, recommence on week five. We will be having a dinner with our patron, Professor Marcus Dusotoy. So um, do get in touch if you're interested in dining with him. But yeah, th there will be no talk next week, and on week five, there will be no talk as well. Okay. Uh, the next talk will be on week six. It will be by Professor Alex Halliday, uh, who um, is going to uh, talk about the origin of the moon. All right. So. Thank you for coming.